Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our webinar uh, for this morning with uh, Blue Chip Infotech and Ninja One. Um, we'll get started in a couple of minutes uh, and uh, we'll kick things off uh, shortly. Just give everybody a couple more minutes to, to join. We've got two minutes before we will kick off our, uh, our webinar this morning. Well, welcome everyone. Thanks uh, for joining our webinar this morning. Uh, my name is uh, Peter Pisanello. For those who, who don't know me, I'm a, a product manager here at Blue Chip Infotech. And uh, we thank you for joining our webinar this morning with Ninja One, who are uh, one of our great uh, partners. And uh, this morning, we're going to talk about the MSP automation framework. And as you know, as an MSP, automation is a key driver for efficiency. So. Uh, this webinar will explore how we can build and cultivate a culture of uh, automation that uh, obviously will dramatically increase uh, technician uh, decrease sorry technicians time spent on uh, tasks and freeing up time to do more important things so uh, that's what we'll go through today uh, and uh, please stay on as uh, as we have also we're giving away uh, lunch on us with some uber eats vouchers so please stay on and uh, we'll be getting them out to you shortly our marketing team will, will get them out and also please stay on to the very end as we have our lucky prize draw um, which we'll give away at the end as well so just some quick introductions on uh, the speakers this this morning so there's myself as mentioned peter um, product manager here at uh, blue chip infotech and we'll have uh, peter uh, uh, brenton uh, uh, from ninja one uh, who will be uh, running through the presentation, as well as MJ, who's Director of Sales here in Asia Pad. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Peter, who will get our presentation underway. Awesome, thanks so much, Peter. Uh, I'm super excited to present on this webinar. Um, because you and APAC are a day ahead of us here in the US, you get a sneak preview of this content. Um, I was really excited to put it together. I'm hoping to put it to other good uses. So um, just like with everything, you're in the future and you get to see it first. Um, uh, as Peter said, my name is Pete Breton. I'm the Senior Director of Product Marketing at Ninja One. Um, and my focus is really on uh, talking with our MSP partners, understanding the pain that they feel, um, understanding how Ninja can solve that pain, and really working uh, to translate our product into value for our partners. And I think um, talking about automation is a really great way to do that because you all are so focused on building your business and scaling profitably. And really the only way to do that is through automation. So I've got some slides here to talk about um, really the, the automation framework that you can um, align with as an MSP to really build a culture of automation and, and really lean into the idea of automation, um, particularly around device management, you know, as Ninja One is a, an RMM vendor. Um, so that's really what our focus will be. We will spend about half of the webinar in the Ninja One platform uh, showing off kind of step by step how you can build out automation in Ninja. But it's also important to think about this from a business perspective. So that's where we'll start. I do like to start with this kind of a cautionary quote when it comes to automation. Um, automation applied to an efficient operation will magnify efficiency and applied to an inefficient operation will magnify the inefficiency. So we're not automating for automation's sake. 
we're automating so that you can grow and scale profitably um, and so that you can mature in your operations as an MSP. You know, the difference between uh, uh, an operationally mature MSP and, and an operationally mature MSP, uh, sorry, an operationally immature MSP and an operationally mature MS MSP uh, is very significant in terms of, you know, profit margins and growth rate. And, um, you know, if you can build a true framework and adopt that framework around automation, it can really help you reach those levels of uh, operational maturity that other MSPs may struggle to, to reach. And that can really help you stand out in your market. So not only um, are we not doing it, uh, pursuing automation for automation's sake, we're pursuing it for real return on investment. Um, this slide here, I think this actually came, uh, the, the, the data here came from the Service Desk Institute, I believe, um, really breaks out um, what the cost is of handling a ticket, for example. And so each price point here uh, assumes that the person, each person in the chain is working on a ticket for an hour. And so if a level one tech can, and I think this is probably in USD, not uh, Australian dollars. So it may not be a perfect one-to-one -one here, but um, you know the assumption here is if a tier one support person is working on a ticket for an hour, it's gonna cost you about $25. Up to 55 if it's tier two and up to 90 if it's tier three. And so what that means is there's a real cost of doing business. And, and the farther left you can shift, the better the return on investment. And you see that automation and prevention all the way to the left, because even if you have that tier three tech working on building out an automation and let's say it takes two three hours it costs you know you a couple hundred dollars to build like let's say a really complex workflow here um over time run tens hundreds thousands of times that uh, the cost of that um, automation per run essentially drops to zero and so the more you can invest even if you're using those uh those kind of most precious and, and top tier resources that you have um the the more return on investment you're going to get um the the farther left you can push whether that be self-service whether that be taking tier three tasks or traditionally tier three tasks and pushing them down to tier one through partial automation or even again all the way to the left through complete automation um the the greater return you're going to get and and we're not talking small amounts of money here it can be very substantial savings um purely from a dollar perspective, but then also think about the opportunity cost, right? So that, you know, 15 minute task that a tier three support person is doing, if it's fully automated, even if it costs you a hundred or $200 worth of, of, of uh, labor time to put together, those are, you know, 15 minutes each time that a tier three tech can be focused on other things. So there's the opportunity cost, both from a client support perspective, but also from a, a growth perspective, right? Those tier three, um, uh, uh, technicians are are really a, a great lever of growth for you and freeing them up really lets them step in and create a great relationship with your clients and deliver that outstanding support that's going to um, help you get those best clients support them and and hopefully get them to turn into advocates for your business so again we're not just doing this to automate we're doing this because there's a substantial return on investment in doing so so let's jump into some actual recommendations here i'm going to go through um, four slides, each one talking a little bit about different things that you can focus on from an automation perspective, going from simple to complex. Um, we do wrap that up on a, with a fifth slide, giving real life examples that we've seen in the wild. Um, so you, um, this is really how you can start thinking about identifying automations that you can build in your environment. <clears throat> and with any good recommendation, let's start with the easy stuff, right? The low hanging fruit. Um, the number one recommendation we hear from our MSP partners and that you'll hear from the MSP community in general is when you're looking at automation, the first thing to look at is what is driving a high volume of tickets. Now, not everything can be automated necessarily, but if you can go and look at your tickets every month or every couple of weeks or whatever it may be, and identify the things that are driving repetitive high volumes of tickets, those are your first targets for automation. Now, again, not all of those may be easy to automate or even automatable at all, but they're a great place to start and identify those low hanging fruit that you can go and automate. The second one is whether it's a ticket or not, what are you assigning to technicians or what are your technicians doing time after time, multiple times per week or month? Let's say you have a level two tech doing the same task 10 times a year. If they can do it, essentially spend, you know, two time slots worth of time to build an automation, they've saved eight time slots, right? 
you start little, you start incrementing, you start building these out, and you're talking about very significant time savings. Um, maybe it's not something that's super repetitive, but it's just an easy um, task that we can we can partially automate and reduce down to one click. Let's say it's something that takes five or six steps, and you're usually handing that off to a tier two or tier three tech. Maybe they can automate that and turn it into a one click or a two click task that you can hand off to a level one technician. Again, it's not full automation there, but it is significantly reducing the number of steps and significantly reducing the um, uh, the resource dedicated to that task because it's a level one instead of a level three tech, for example. Um, and then last but not least here, a really good thing to think about from an automation perspective is data collection and monitoring. So uh, Ninja, like any other RMM, has a certain set of information we provide you. And as much as we want it to be all the information you could ever need on, on an endpoint, um, it isn't, you know, there are things that you're going to want that we haven't built in. Um, and so any information gathering that you can automate, that's one of those things that's generally very easy to automate. Uh, that's a really great low hanging fruit because again, then you may not have to remote into a device or or run a, a one-off one -off script to collect information at the point you need it. You can build out these automations to collect that data automatically. Uh, we recently did a survey with our partners. We had uh, a few hundred responses across um, APAC, EMEA, and North America, um, and 99% of our partners who responded are saving time with automation. They're all doing automation and they're all saving time with automation. That one person, or uh, those probably, you know, three or four people, I guess, um, maybe they're curmudgeons, maybe they're not using automation, uh, maybe they were grumpy that day, I don't know, but 99% of our partners have saved time with automation. Not only that, almost half of them have saved more than five hours per week. And we're talking, a lot of these are, are one person shops some of them are you know 20 30 40 employee shops sure but um a lot this is an average across all of those and and we're saving five plus hours per week through automation outside of the built-in stuff like patching and backup and, and all of those things that are we're going to automate easily for you so next let's step into a little bit more complexity um let's invest in those slightly more complex automation so um this is a great place to look at what are you doing with remote access that you can do with a script or automation instead. And here's a really good reason why. If, if it takes five to seven minutes on average for a remote access session to, to run its course, um, and there's time around scheduling and, and just talking to the, the end user, um, if you can pull that out and replace it with a script uh, or, or any kind of automation, you're talking about very significant time savings. Um, let's, you know, let's say you can cut out 10% of your remote access sessions or, or, or 5%, that's a lot of time savings. And so, again, if there are things that can be done by automation that you were doing remote, with remote access, you're talking about a really significant turn on, return on investment. Um, not only is there an efficiency gain here, but potentially also a standardization of, del of service delivery here. What tasks are prone to errors? Automation by its very nature standardizes outcomes and delivery. So because you're automating it, you're doing step one, two, three, four, five, all in a row, the same way every time, there is value by default in standardization. And so if you can identify those tasks that maybe they're not complex, maybe they're just a lot of little finicky things that you have to do in a process. If you can automate all of that and you can cut out the human element, which is where the mistakes are going to come in, you can really drive a better delivery of service because you have a standardized delivery of service. And you know, every time I run this automation, I'm going to get the exact same outcome. Now, in the long run, that's going to lead to efficiency gains and, and improvements on, you know, ticket reduction and that sort of thing. But it's also just going to be a better IT experience for your clients. Um, and then finally here, uh, what tasks can I make fully closed loop? This is really where an RMM, if it's uh, done right, can, can really shine. This is where you're detecting incidents, remediating them, and closing out alerts all in one go so if something happens i fix it i close it out zero touch from a human um, this is where an rmm can really stand out because the more of these you can do uh that's where you know there's huge time savings and it, it is hard to do like these ones can be more difficult they can be more complex um you need to maybe have built-in validation but uh if you can really invest in these closed loop uh identification or remediation steps you can you can really free up some time for your team um, about 80% of our partners reduce their ticket volume after switching to Ninja One. And obviously this is from an existing RMM. Almost everyone who comes to Ninja has an RMM in place. And so about 80% of our partners have said that they 
when they switch, they would get they get a reduced ticket volume from their clients because they have a better managed environment. And about 70% say they are reducing their mean uh, mean resolution time. So not only are they getting fewer tickets, they are better at um, remediating 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 those tickets faster. Need to have a drink of water there. Awesome. Last one here. Uh, sorry, second to last one here is now let's talk about those complete workflows. Um, which multi-step complex processes take up a lot of time. A really standout example here is device setup, right? How can I automate or partially automate device setup and get back a lot of time? That's again, it's not complex time. It's um, something that maybe you know you have a, a higher level tech doing, but it's just a lot of steps. There's a lot of finicky stuff in there. There's a lot of um, opportunity for error. You really have to understand what's going on. That's a really good example of a complex multi-step process that you can automate. Um, in addition here, how can you use, this should just say an RMM, but an RMM for monitoring and as a logic switch to route automations and tickets. So um, for example, if you um, detect something on a, uh, is going on in a machine, how can you automate the creation of those tickets Make sure it's getting to the right person. Make sure there's context in the ticket about what's going on so that when your tech gets to it, they already have context and the ability to remediate it uh, from, from moment one. Uh, this is, you know, this is where mature, really, really operationally mature MSPs can step in and start building this stuff. It takes time though. There, this is a journey. You start with the simple stuff, you work your way up. A lot of times those simple things can be building blocks for those uh, complete workflows. Um, one of our partners actually in Australia, uh, Leo Rakeman, he's at Cloud4X Enterprise Systems, uh, gave us this lovely quote, um, you know, with the automations we built in Ninja, onboarding a new device takes 10 minutes in terms of manpower and a level one tech can do it, which from compared to before they were with Ninja, it's a 95% reduction in man hours. So you can really lean in here and, and provide a lot of value to your organization in terms of time savings and return on investment if you're leaning into uh, automation around those complete workflows. All right. Last but not least on this, it's not just for RMM. Um, obviously, we're known for our RMM, but um, there are other things that you can automate as well that can save you time. Can you automate your documentation? Can you pull information from a machine, write it to whatever IT documentation tool you're using? If so, that's a lot of administrative time that your techs don't need to spend on documentation. You're still going to have that documentation. It's still going to be up to date. There are still things that are going to have to be entered manually because there are more context and you're not just pulling data. But if you can automate that documentation, it can be really impactful. Um, can you use that documentation then to automate other tasks? So a really good example of this is, let's say you, you're running Sentinel-1 or some other um, EDR solution and you have a site token. Can you document that site token and then use it in your own automations? That's a great way to leverage the documentation you have to drive additional automation. And then finally, what can you do to reduce the administrative burden of ticketing in particular through automation? So again, by providing context, by making sure the right technicians are getting those tickets, to, by making sure that maybe there are some tasks that you don't, your technicians don't need to touch that you can auto respond to and kind of um, get uh, uh, ben the benefits of automation directly in, uh, sorry, outside of your RMM and then your ticketing platform or your PSA. So 22% um, of tickets supposedly can be resolved at essentially zero cost. Uh, I pulled that data from, um, I think, again, the Service Desk Institute. Uh, I think that's that's that could be high, but it's pretty impactful if it's true. Um, I, I like that statistic because it does show you whether or not it's over or under, um, that there is a lot of value in automating ticket resolution if and where you can. And then um, this goes back to that second slide, but it, it costs about $1.60, this is a global average, but $1.60 to manually handle a ticket per minute. So again, it can be really impactful if you can just automate some of that administrative burden away. So let's talk about some um, uh, building a culture of automation. So we've identified some targets for automation, but how do we actually turn that into um, turn our company into a company that focuses on automation. All of these recommendations here uh, came from deep dive conversations that I've had with our MSP partners. Um, these are all things that our partners are doing. I'd also love for all of you to jump into chat and actually put in your own ideas. So what are you doing today to build a culture of automation at your company? If you, if you toss those into chat, 
uh, we're going to read them out after I'm done with the slide. We'd love to get you guys to share your own information and, and help improve, you know, the, the learning outcome here for your, for your fellow MSPs. So uh, let's start with number one. <clears throat> you can't really do this if you don't have a clear idea in mind, if you don't know your strategy and your goals. So you may be looking purely at the efficiency side. You may be looking at standardization. You may be looking at a certain number of hours or a, a way to reduce your mean resolution time or any of those things. Having the, an idea of those goals will help you prioritize what you're automating and what you're not. The second one here, I actually think this is the most important, number two and three here, um, it's get buy-in from your team. Um, there's a lot you can do here. There are a lot of very tactical things, a lot of really strategic things that you can do to to get your team to buy into this idea of automation. You can gamify it or incentivize it. So, you know, anyone, everyone who builds um, uh, an automation this month that's deployed in production, get some kind of small bonus or a gift card or a Sono speaker, who knows? Um, you could find something to do to incentivize the identification and creation of automations. This is really, really powerful. And the more you lean into it, the more you do it, um, the more people are going to not only buy in, but also they're going to want to win. They're going to want to be the people who are identifying and building those best automations. And then finally, this is something we've seen be really, really impactful is if you can either find someone at your organization today, or if you're hiring, bring someone in to uh, be your automation evangelist, someone who's uh, you know a PowerShell expert or who happens to be just really interested in, in and love the idea of, of automation, who will spend time working with everyone to identify those options, run script them out run them get them in the environment make sure everyone knows how to use them because having them in your environment is great but also making sure everyone understands what's happening and um you know why things are doing the things that they're doing is going to be really important so if you can get buy-in if you can if you can really um incentivize your team to identify automations and build them you're going to have a, a great result here's a tactic to help with that if you have a, a monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly meeting with your team where you have all your tickets you um you go through them, you identify things to automate, you um, have people pitch their automation ideas. Maybe you can do like a um essentially like a I don't know, like a QBR with your team about what have we automated, what's worked, what hasn't, what's driven results. This is going to be a great way to get everyone together and buy into the idea, but also identify new opportunities for automation. Maybe identify automations that aren't providing as much value that you can sunset, um, and then hopefully additional ideas to drive more um. Uh, more efficiency. There is a slight cost here. Uh, this last, the second to last one here. You do need to usually provide some kind of non-production devices to your employees so that they can test and vet those automations. You don't want to just dump them out in the wild and see what happens. You do want to test them first, and you probably do want to invest in measuring and tracking results. So there is some setup. There is some administrative burden and and sort of leadership that has to happen here around those last two. Um, but if you're leaning into these, you're going to see a, a really great result and hopefully be able to build a really strong culture of automation. Peter, any uh, good answers come in here? Um, no, so far, no, no suggestions. Sorry, Peter. All right. Well, that's what we've got for you. If you guys do have anything that's coming in uh, that or sorry, that you think of that um, you've done to build a culture of automation in your MSP, let us know. We'd love to hear from you. And we, I think your peers would as well. And I will ask you for feedback again. <laughs> um, so this next one, again, looking for feedback here. These are some really good examples of um, automations we've seen in the wild. They are in no way, this is no way, in no way comprehensive, right? These are examples. What we hope to provide you here is some ideas that will get you thinking about automation use cases in your environment. Um, again, we've seen all of these happen and work in Ninja. Um, we've had partners who've used all of these in the wild. And so they are real life examples, but if you have your own, we'd love to hear them. Um, so using that kind of format of repetitive, complex, and then we, we pulled in monitoring here. Um, some really good examples like admin password rotation, automating that if you don't have labs or if you're not in a, um, or if you uh, using a local admin account, um, creating new user accounts, a simple thing like restarting services, deploying software, and then um, you know uh, clearing the printer queue every once in a while just to keep it everything working well, right? Complex processes, user onboarding, uh, endpoint setup. Uh, uh, Leo from Cloud4x actually did a really complex VPN deployment and monitoring. It's a really good example. 
um, managing your siloed security suite. So if you're using Ninja's built-in um, integrations for uh, security, you don't need to do this, but if you're using a third-party uh, security software that we don't manage, then using that to deploy and monitor the service and make sure it's running uh, and make sure you know it's it's installed, that can be really impactful there. Mapping network drives, again, good example. And then monitoring, I said that at the beginning, and this is really low-hanging fruit, but you could do things like, um, you know, validating all of your security configurations. I don't know why I print key monitoring is there again, uh, but you can monitor uh, users, right? Are there is there any privilege escalation? Um, you can do network speed tests, and you could do software utilization. Are these are these softwares being used? So these are some real world examples. Again, if you have any ideas, uh, toss them in chat. If not, um, we can go ahead and move on. Doesn't look like it. Okay, so let's jump on to the next slide here. This is where we actually get into the demo. So these are the four examples that I'm going to go over. Um, there's a, a little bit of a security bent here on the auto remove of GoTo. I didn't know we were using GoTo when I wrote this. Uh, new device setup, the failed login detection. This is a great way to detect if um, uh, an end user has failed to log in and potentially disable them. And then um, using ticketing to do uh, automation around password reset. So um, I'll jump right into these. I'll give you a quick overview of the Ninja One platform first, just so you can, if you haven't seen it before, you can get oriented. Um, the point here isn't to show you these automations. The point here is to show you how automation can be done in Ninja um, and hopefully give you, again, some ideas that you can take and go and implement in your own organization. Um, so I'll go ahead and jump in there. It'll take just a second to get up. I'm going to use um, this particular environment just to do the uh, broad overview, and then I'll switch to a different environment that's set up for the webinar. Um, the first time you log into Ninja, this is what you'll see. You'll see um, all of your client organizations on the left here. We do use a red, yellow, and green. Actually, we can go ahead and um, turn this one green really quick. Um, only because I'm OCD and absolutely feel like I have to. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and reset all those alerts really quick. Um, we do use a red, yellow, green stoplight uh, style uh, notification here. Red means it needs attention. Yellow means there are some alerts. You may wanna look into it. Green means you're safe. So uh, this particular client is in great shape. I can ignore them and everyone else needs my attention. Obviously, you see some reds here. This is maybe a failed backup. We have a down server down here. Um, and then we have some alerts like uh, devices that need OS patches or software patches or some custom alerts, et cetera. So this is a 5,000 foot view. You can also see those alerts here broken out by type. And I can see what Ninja is doing on my behalf from uh, immediately, what's going on and what automations are running right now. I also have a bunch of other dashboards around patching. For example, I can jump in here. Um, this is our patching dashboard. You can see all the details of what's going on in this environment from a patch perspective. And for example, our backup dashboard. So there's a lot of different ways to explore what's going on Ninja in Ninja at any given time. So now I'll jump into the actual automation bit, but it's good to give you that quick overview. Um, the core of Ninja automation is going to happen in what's called our policies. Now, um, Ninja's policy-based management allows you to, I'll use this one, um, really centralize and consolidate your device management capabilities. So everything you see here is part of one policy. So what you're monitoring, what scripts you want to deploy, how you're patching, if you're using an integrated antivirus, how you want to manage it, third-party application installation, and patching, and backup, all in one centralized policy. Now, why that's valuable is every single device in Ninja will have a policy assigned to it, and a policy will usually manage anywhere from 10 to 10,000 endpoints, right? And so you're standardizing how you're managing your devices, and you're giving us a set of instructions on how you want that device managed. This isn't about day-to-day -day what you're going to be in there doing. This is about telling Ninja how you want your device managed and how we're going to handle it for you. This is going to drive standardization. This is going to drive efficiency, and all of this is about automation. Okay, so once you're in policies, conditions are what you're going to monitor for. Scheduled scripts are what you're going to deploy. Patching, obviously, is how you want to handle patching. We do Windows, Mac, and Linux patching. Antivirus, if you have, um, uh, uh, if you're using our antivirus, you'll manage that here as well. So you can see managing Bitdefender. 
third-party application patching. Uh, let's say I want to add a bunch of products here. Let's select all. We'll add those in. We've got 130, I think, applications on Windows and about 100 on Mac. Um, and then backups are managed here as well. Now, let's jump into that first example. So I am going to use a policy to detect, go to, and remove it. Now, why would I want to do that? Well, um, if you're using, or in this case, it's not go to webinar, I'm thinking about go to assist or go to resolve. If you are using um, a particular remote access solution, a potential attack vector is every other remote access solution. So if you use TeamViewer or Splashtop, which come with Ninja, and suddenly you're detecting that GoTo is installed or real VNC or um, I should know more of these off the top of my head, ConnectWise Control, um, then that's a potential attack vector. Well, okay, from a security perspective, let's detect that and remove it immediately. So to do that, we're going to create a condition. I actually have, have one already created here. It's called go to install. Pretty easy, right? So this is how you set up a condition in Ninja. You can add a new one. In this case, I'm showing you an existing one. I'm going to go up here and I'm going to select the software category for conditions, and it exists. So we're detecting if a software exists, and the software we're looking for is go to. Okay. Once that's detected, we're going to go ahead and shoot off a Slack message to our IT admins. Maybe we're going to open a ticket. Um, and we could, for example, I don't know if I actually have a script here, uninstall application, go to, go to, and apply. What this is going to do is it's going to detect that go to is installed and attempt to uninstall it with this uninstall application script. That's closed loop remediation. And you could do this for all of the major attack vectors. You could do this for all of your remote access tools. You could do this for all your other RMMs. You could do this for uh, RMM agents. And that's going to detect and respond to this security event in particular, which is someone else is installing remote access on your, on your managed device, which is probably a bad thing, right? So that's one really clear example. And there's a lot of different ways you could use this. Yes, um, identifying this, this attack vector is a good one, but there are plenty of other things you can do to detect software and remove it or detect that software doesn't exist and install it. That's probably not a security um, action there, but maybe it's, you know, you expect uh, auto elevate to be on every single one of your endpoints. You detect that it's not on there and then automatically install it. So on the opposite side. Now, what would that look like? So I have this on um, the Wayland Utani policy. And so I'm going to go ahead and uh, actually close out of this policy and go over to a device that has that installed. So it's this one here, you can see that I'm using that Wayland Utani um, policy. I'm going to go ahead and from my library, install application. All right, I'm going to upload file. And I believe, there we go, go to assist opener. I'm going to go ahead and, and run this and install it. I do need to validate really quick. Uh, this is, sorry about that. Um, we do force re-authentication anytime you're going to do a potentially instruction, uh, destructive action, just from a security perspective. And I'm going to install that quietly. And I'm going to go ahead and hit apply. So this is going to run. It's going to take a couple minutes. It's going to, um, you know, go and try to install it, and it's going to uh, run on this machine. We'll come back to it. But shortly uh, here, we should see this. Uh, oh, actually, it might have been that quick. Um, Oh, it was just reset. In a few minutes, we should see that this um, application was installed and we should see a, a, a notification and alert that we've detected it. All right. So we'll come back to that in just a couple of minutes and we'll move on to the second example. Um, and that's new device setup. Again, we are going to use policies because policies are really the core of automation in Ninja. So I'm going to go ahead and jump back. Oh, I'm not going to jump into that policy. I'm going to jump into a child policy of Wayland Yutani called workstation onboarding. I don't actually want this stuff to run, so uh, that's why I'm, I'm using a child policy here. Um, but, oops, oh, under schedule scripts here, um, we can, huh. Well, let's set it up live. Um, I thought I had set this up here, but let's go ahead and set it up. New device setup. Let's go ahead and set this to run once immediately. What that's gonna do, this is a really powerful option in Ninja where this is only gonna run the first time a device checks into this policy. So 
the exact use case here is new device setup. So the first time a device checks in, it's going to run a series of automations. So let's say the most obvious one here is we're going to create a service account admin. Okay, this is going to create an admin account on the device with a randomized password and write that password to a custom field. So that's step one. Then we're going to do something, let's say we are going to want to work on our security a little bit. So let's block outbound net communications from things like uh, PowerShell and uh, Word and Calculator, right? Because we don't want them reaching out to, to, to the internet. They have no reason to. Let's also do something like, um, I had a particular example here that I wanted to run up. Ah, disable USB. So we don't want people plugging in mass storage devices, and we probably also want to um, uh, enable BitLocker. Let's just say, again, we're going to run all of these things, and then we're also going to want to install some kind of productivity applications. Obviously, this is kind of like a, a, a random example here, but what's going to happen now is the first time a device checks into this policy, we are going to run step by step through these. And so I'm going to do this first. Once it's successful, we'll move on to the next and then the next and the next. Just like that, I have done a pretty robust configuration of a new endpoint. And realistically, you know, if you have different policies for different clients, you can have slight variations in these things that uh, customize them to the client, which allows really automated device setup that's customized to your client at scale. Um, obviously, this is one simple example. You could also put all of these in one script. You could have them all as their separate scripts. Some of these come built into Ninja, some you'd have to write yourself. But the point is, it's really easy to just set up this multi-step automation and go ahead and, for example, automate your, your new device setup. Um, we actually just did a webinar in January walking through a real world example of this and actually showing that being set up live. I would encourage you to check it out because this is something that our partners are doing again um, at scale, our most uh, most mature ones, and this is the exact process that uh, Cloud 4x went through to build to to do their new device setup. It's just building out a set of automations and running it the first time a device checks in. Awesome. Uh, let's jump into failed login detection in a second. I do want to jump back to that device and just see if that has triggered yet. This is a live webinar; anything could happen. So here we go. The following software GoTo was installed. So we did detect that GoTo was installed. Um, we also did create a ticket. So I can go ahead and uh, let's see if I can control click on that. I can't. We did create a ticket because it's not supposed to. It's going to be a little bit, it's going to have a little context here. We know which device it was installed on. We do know what happened here. I could actually go in and start remediation, et cetera. And it also did kick off that script to try to uninstall it. So we do see that happen there live. Um, so let's go into the next example, failed login detected. This is a much, much more complex example. So bear with me a little bit. We're going to use a couple different things. We are going to use policies for detection. We're also going to use our robust custom fields to actually do our monitoring here. So let's jump into what we're going to do. Let's go back to that device. And actually, I'm going to open another tab here. I think that'll be easier. Um, and I'm going to jump right into to a policy, to that particular policy, Wayland. Actually, jump into that policy here, and you're going to see these two monitors here. They're under conditions, and we have failed login attempts and disable user failed logins. This failed login attempts, what we're going to do is, again, it's a monitor. We're going to monitor on the Windows event log, and we're going to look for security events, and we're going to look particularly for event ID 4625. This is local user failed to log in. That's the event ID. Not only that, we are going to actually limit it. So it's only going to trigger if 4625 is written to three times in 15 minutes. So what that's saying is if someone fails to log in three times in 15 minutes, we are going to trigger this condition, right? Really powerful. You can monitor so much with the Windows event log if you really dig into it. Uh, but I really like this example because it's really illustrative of the power. So we're monitoring for fail local failed logins. Um, and what are we going to do? Well, we are going to run a couple scripts. We're going to get the, the failed user, log, like the, the username of the person who failed to log in. We're going to count those failed login attempts for that particular user. And we're going to see if that user is enabled or disabled. And we're going to write those to a custom field. I'll, I'll, I'll show you next what that looks like. So if I jump back into that device and I go to my custom fields, 
we can see um, I don't have any failed logins. I have zero failed logins. The user account is enabled. That's the default. And we don't have any user that's failed to log in. So it's a blank slate. Um, and I'll show you those scripts in a second. So then what are we going to do? Well, we're going to we're going to check those custom fields, these ones here. And if we see that count failed login attempts is greater than five and the user account is not disabled, so it's false, then we are going to do a second step. We're going to disable that user, update the local user status, and we're going to create a ticket. All right. So let's show you what that looks like. I'm actually going to remote into this machine here. I believe it's on. Hopefully it's right under my desk. So hopefully it's there and we're in good shape. Take just a second to jump in. All right, so we're on that machine. And uh, I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna go to this one called guest account. And I'm gonna fail to log in a couple times. So let's type in some random stuff. Some more random stuff. I got to do it at least five times. And oh, I really hope that wasn't the password. <laughs> uh, we'll see here in a second. That should fail. Um, and then we uh, we can we can watch that detect it live and hopefully uh, trigger all of those things that we wanted it to trigger. It's weird that it's saying welcome because it really shouldn't. So in a couple minutes, and we'll come back to this. Um, in a couple minutes, we should see that update. Um, but in the meantime, I want to show you what that script looks like. Let's do it from here. Um, if I go into our library, we do have a script library here. There are about 50 scripts you can import automatically, as well as several more built in here and you can write your own and categorize them and all those things in this case i am going to look at um uh, webinar dash count failed logins so this is what a script might look like all i'm doing here is uh, i'm reading in the failed account login username from those custom fields turning it into a string i am then going to count the number of instances of that uh 4625 event, I'm gonna count them, and then I'm writing them back out to a different field, count failed logins. So again, really easy to read some information into a script, do some kind of automation, and then write back out to a custom field. So that's what that's gonna look like. All right, I'm gonna go back and check that device. I don't think it'll be quite ready yet, because um, again, these things do ch take a little bit of time, um, but we will check back in on that in just a minute. If not, I'll I'll force it to trigger so you can see what it looks like. And we'll jump to the last automation. All right. Oh, oh no, just reset. So um, I really want it to trigger immediately. Ah, action started. Run webinar. Count failed logins. It is triggering. So we see here in the uh, action log over here, we can see that. Uh, the condition was triggered, uh, run failed login, we're gonna count, then we're uh, triggering another condition, and now if we go to custom fields, glad that happened quick, and I go ahead and hit refresh, it might take just a minute to refresh. It's less dramatic if I have to repeat myself. I'll go back here. Um, you can see that we are uh, counting failed login results. Yeah, there were 19 failed login attempts. I, I was testing this earlier. Uh, and then we ran uh, get local status. So that should, cross my fingers, here we go. It is now written, okay, user count is enabled. We have 19 failed logins. And this is the, the uh, um, account that failed to log in. All that's now written to these custom fields. And shortly thereafter, probably hasn't happened yet, uh, Okay, and now we're disabling the failed user. So that is also running. And if I go ahead and jump in, we also said it would create a ticket. We could see that, again, we know the device. We know that the user uh, uh, has failed to log in and that we're disabling it. And so, you know, I can go and take action. Um, it may take a minute again to go ahead and update that, um, that last custom field to disabled. 
might take a few minutes, but that will happen as well. The, the account will be disabled and you'll see this updated to false. So again, really complex automation, multi-step. I'm using custom fields here to get and act on additional bits of data. And this is gonna happen fully automated, right? I'm a local user. I failed to log in a bunch of times in a short amount of time, right into custom field, detecting what's in the custom field, and then taking an action again. That's really com a really complex automation that can have a, a really good result. All right, I'm gonna try to refresh one more time. Ah, there we go. And now that user is disabled, just like that. Zero touch, except for the refresh button. All right, last example, I promise. Ninja ticketing. Um, this is where we're gonna talk about password resets. Um, so if I go to Ninja Ticketing, this is kind of the view of Ninja Ticketing. Um, you can see all our tickets here. You can see you know, how all of those tickets were created, whether it be a condition or the SysTray icon or our end user portal. If I click into any of these, you will see those more. Um, you know, there is, we're automatically assigning the device. We know which organization they're in. We have uh, completely custom forms on the, the left here. We have all the context that we have about the particular um, uh, incident here, um, but you're interested in automation. So this is the, the technician view, but let's go ahead and jump in and look at what automation would look like. So, oops, if I go over here to apps and I jump into Ninja Ticketing here, you can go ahead and add any of the apps that we integrate with here. Uh, but if I jump into ticketing and I go over to automations, and then finally to event-based automations, I can see our example. In this particular example, we are going to detect if a, a, a password reset comes in via email. And there's a lot more complexity you can have here. Our automation for ticketing is really, really robust, uh, but this is a really good example. We are going to parse the subject line for password, and then we are going to take action. So what are we gonna do? When a new ticket is created, if the subject contains password, we are going to take action. These are the actions. We're gonna add some tags. We're then gonna send an email to the end user and say, hey, I'm just making this up, but we have this password reset tool. This is your, your password reset link. Click here and go ahead and, um, and reset it yourself. And then we're going to resolve the ticket. Again, this is one of those examples of potentially zero touch automation from a, a ticket that came in where they asked for a reset and you can provide them with a knowledge base article or some kind of asset to solve their problem and it's set to resolve. Now, the good thing is they can respond and it'll open that ticket back up, but if they're able to resolve the issue with that automated response, you've got yourself a zero touch resolution. Those are the uh, four automations I wanted to show you today. Um, again, the point isn't for you to go and implement those automations in particular, although they're all really you know, good automations that we've seen in the wild. Um, the point is to show you how you can automate in Ninja. Um, I actually think, um, well, anyway, um, with, so the, the purpose is, you know, it's really easy to automate Ninja. I will tell you setting all these four examples up from really simple with GoTo to really complex with the, that failed login detection. It only took me about two hours with setting up and testing. And I have a marketing background. You know, I, I learned PowerShell two and a half years ago uh, for Ninja. Um, so it's not hard to get started. What's hard is identifying the opportunities carving out a little bit of time to make them happen, testing them, and then building on top of it, building that culture of automation. Um, so if you can do that, you'll start seeing a lot of results from little effort early on, which is really fantastic. With that, I will um, jump back to our slides and hand it off to MJ for the next slide. Awesome, thank you, Pete. So, uh, yeah, look, I guess, um... Everyone here has seen quite a bit of Ninja, but um, just to kind of uh, put in uh, in slide view, uh, this is Ninja's offering right here. So um, at the end of the day, we do have a unified IT platform and uh, these top uh, four that are in orange right here are gonna be the core offering that Ninja does. So we've got our patch management, software deployment, as you've already seen, along with the alerting and the monitoring and scripting and automation. Now from there, we do have different add-ons that you can um, attach onto Ninja, uh, such as your remote access, endpoint security, uh, backup, which we briefly talked about, the ticketing and documentation. And since we're on RMM platform and there's probably a bunch of different tools that you use in your tool set, uh, we've got integrations with um, different PSAs. So we've got our Autotask, ConnectWise Manage, and Halo PSA. 
Uh, from there, we do have integrations with um, a couple of different uh, antivirus suppliers, such as Sentinel One, Bitdefender, and Webroot. Um, you would have already seen the um, Team Viewer, but we also do have Splash Top integrations. And um, as you saw as well, too, we can um, send out any of our alerts via notification channels. So this could be your Microsoft Teams, your uh, Slack, uh, WebEx Teams. Um, and then we do have a couple other extra integrations such as IT Glue and BrightGage as well, too. Uh, so this is really the whole Ninja platform all in one slide right here. Now, lastly, just to kind of uh, uh, finish everything off, um, on the next slide, we do have unmatched support. Um, customer service is really the key to everything that Ninja does. Uh, we want to make sure that it is a proper partnership between um, all parties here. Um, so we have been rated number one consistently uh, for our support. Um, it is 24 by 5 support, and we do offer um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. support on the weekends as well, too. Uh, but what we do have is uh, uh, we've got an average CSAT score of 98 across all support tickets. Um, the average response time to uh, tickets is uh, about just, just over an hour. Um, and the unique thing about Ninja is that we do give uh, free and unlimited onboarding and training. Um, so the whole idea about this is that if you want to get trained up or if you're adding new technicians into your organization, uh, you can give us a call and we'll walk them through your own environment to make sure that they're fully up to speed. Um, if there are any new features that have come out or if you want to, you know, just, um, you know, get extra training from us on how to best do anything, um, feel free to reach out. You know, we're, we, we, want to, we want this to be a, a, a true partnership and um, for conversations to go both the ways. So with that, I will pass it over to Pete um, on the blue chip side of things, and um, I'll let you uh, talk about the giveaway here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you to both Peter and MJ uh, for presenting this morning. Um, I'm sure we all saw the benefits of cultivating this culture of automation, how it can really, really, for an MSP, drive a lot of efficiencies having a unified IT platform and running those automations. So thank you uh, to our Ninja One friends. Um, so what's next? Well, um, first of all, um, from the presentation, just want to just check if you have any questions uh, from this morning's presentations, feel free to either put them in the chat or the question box if you do have any questions. So we'll give you a little bit of time to do that, um, uh, just in case there are some questions. And then we'll get our giveaway underway, which we're going to be giving away a, a Sonos Bluetooth speaker. Um, and if you do have any other questions after the presentation, feel free to uh, contact myself and the team uh, just at msp at bluechipit.com.au and we'd be more than, happy, help, more than happy to give you some help. So just wait a few more seconds for some questions. Um, but I do, I'll, I'll start off, I'll kick the ball, get the ball rolling with questions. Um, Let's just say, Peter and MJ, I'm a new MSP and I don't have a unified IT operations platform. How long would it roughly take me to start uh, to set up Ninja? Yeah, so a uh, good question, Peter. Thank you. Um, what we what we tend to see, and actually th this is going back to that survey I mentioned, um, way more than half of our partners say that they are fully onboarded in two weeks. And it's around 95 to 98% say, in under a month. So what we're saying here is you can rip out your existing RMM um, or spin up, you know, your your own business and get fully onboarded with Ninja, supporting your clients, patching your endpoints, managing your devices. Um, the vast majority of time in under two weeks, and almost always in under a month. Obviously, there are bigger guys with com with more complexity there, but um, we have a case study on our website from one of our partners in the UK, I believe, that moved over 4,000 endpoints in a weekend. Obviously not an ideal situation. Um, you want a little bit more planning than that, but um, it can happen and it can work. And we very often hear, you know, two weeks to a month is like all it takes to be fully onboarded, understand Ninja. Not only that, um, training a new technician, again, that survey, we got responses that more than half say in under three hours. And again, almost everybody said an under one business day to really just under dive in and understand Ninja and really be ramped up. So really fast. Hmm, sounds good. That sounds promising. And and one more question I've got as well. Say for example, I currently have an RMM tool, and I like I like what I've seen today, and I want to migrate across to to Ninja One. Um, how easy is that? Is that going to be a bit of a challenge? 
it really isn't. Again, going back to that timeline, it can be a very, very quick rollover. Uh, we do tend to have um, options in place to help you switch, to help you ramp over. Um, and, you know, the number one recommendation is going to be keep your current RMM for a short period of time while, while you're onboarding Ninja so you can use it to roll out the Ninja agent. You're going to save yourself a lot of time if you can use whatever RMM you have and deploy Ninja at scale with that RMM. Um, get all your devices in the right organizations. Uh, you're going to save a lot of time. Not only that, one of the best things about Ninja is we're using scripting languages you already know and you already use. So you can usually pull out the scripts from whatever platform you have. Hopefully they don't make it too hard, export them, and then literally just upload them to Ninja and off you go. Um, so my number one recommendation would be try not to do, you know, day one, you're done with X and day two, you're on with Ninja. Overlap a little bit so you can leverage that to your own benefit. Oh, excellent. All right. And last question from me, I promise. Um, when it comes to the onboarding and support, um, just want to emphasize this, there's no charge to that? Yeah, correct. Um, it's funny, I've seen some of our competitors um, say this against us that, oh, you know, Ninja Ninja doesn't have a professional services team to, to you know, train you and support you. Well, we do, we just don't charge for it. We're not charging you hundreds or thousands of dollars to, to do what we need to to make you successful. We only grow when you grow. And so we want you to be successful. And that's why we have that free and unlimited onboarding training and support. Fantastic. That sounds like you're really here to help. And I'm sure that's what MSPs need because they have lots of challenges that they face each and every day. All right, well, uh, thanks for that. Uh, we'll now uh, run our uh, giveaway uh, prize draw. We'll get that up and running. Peter, yes. sorry, before you go on, I just noticed um, Nishan had his hand up, so I'm not sure if oh. he's got a question, whether he can come off mute. Oh, okay, sorry, I didn't see that. Might have to type it in the, the chat, because I'm not sure if I can. Can, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, I was yes, asking, for the, for the scripting and all, do we get support with scripting as well? Like if I have a tech that's a lower tech, I'm not in the office, he needs to do some scripting, he needs to figure it out. Do you guys help with the automation scripting as well? No. Um, the uh, scripting we have to figure out. Sorry about that. Sorry about sorry that. About that. Um, the, the unfortunate yeah. answer is we don't provide direct scripting support. That being said, we do have quite a few scripts in our script library that have been pre-written for you. Um, we're adding more to that every day. We've actually hired internal resources whose only job is to roll out new additional scripts that our customers are asking for at scale. Um, so if you have uh, your own custom PowerShell script, they're not gonna help you troubleshoot it. Um, our SEs can, can help you um, identify things like how to write to a, a custom field in Ninja, or the best deployment method, whether that be scheduled tasks or policies or ad hoc deployment, but they're not going to actually walk you through um, the the script to write. And then, honestly, the the big answer and the big reason there is it's a liability to Ninja if we give you a script that isn't vetted and you run it and something happens. So, you know, not hands-on PowerShell support, but the the scaffolding around it we can help you with. Okay. Thanks for that question. Thank you. Question. There are a couple of other questions um, just on here. Uh, when can we expect to see the Uber Eats vouchers? Pete, I'll let you answer those ones in particular. Um, there is one in here about, um, so only small, only oh, yeah. a small business startup, is there a minimum agent count or subscription count required? Yes, so there is a minimum. Uh, the starting uh, minimum commitment is uh, 50 based on devices, so it's 50 devices. Uh, to, to get you up and running. Uh, and then it's a minimum of 12 month term and uh, it's a monthly uh, monthly billing. Thanks for that question, Ken. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, there is another okay. question here. I've got one from Scott uh, Hargrave. Uh, we're currently running from another RMM to Ninja uh, and it's been flawless thus far. Okay. More a comment than a question. Thank you. <laughs> that's a good one. Thanks, Scott. Actually, that's a that's a good call out there. Um, so one, thank you, Scott. Um, but two is 
one of the things that we think sets Ninja apart is um, we like to call ourselves the good guys. Um, we have a really good community. We have um, uh, we have our, our PMs and our we have a community team that are on um, uh, Discord and MSP Geek and other community environments, as well as our own internal one called the Ninja Dojo, um, where, you know, we just said we wouldn't help you with PowerShell, but we have hundreds, if not thousands of scripts in our dojo that our partners have shared with others. Um, we have them helping each other in the dojo. We have community-based webinars where people share their own best practices. So things like that. Um, hopefully, Scott, you've experienced this, but um, we do have a really strong community of MSPs helping MSPs, which um, can really help, especially the smaller guys who are just getting started. Well, that uh, concludes our, our webinar this morning. Thank you for everyone attending, and uh, I'm sure you got some benefit uh, from uh, staying on and, and seeing the importance of uh, automation, how it can really benefit you as an MSP. So once again, thank you to our Ninja One uh, uh, friends uh, for helping us with this presentation this morning. And uh, like I said, feel free if you do have any other questions to uh, to ask them uh, using msp at bluechipit.com.au. So that concludes our seminar and we thank you once again. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye everyone.